everyone, welcome to the Bug Scope. Hope you're doing well. I'm broadcasting here back in Ann Arbor and uh, I'm excited to share with you guys one of my favorite caterpillars for a very special reason. Hello. Also, let me know how the sound is because there's no echo, is there? So I have taps open on my computer and my phone. And so it's something I've been playing around with recently of how to manage that and um, not have an echo produced. So does it sound okay? I hope so. No echo? Oh, yay, excellent. Hi, Eddie, how are you? Hi, David, how's it going? Hi, Maron, good to see you. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope you had a wonderful Mother's Day. And hi, David, how are you doing? Excellent, glad to hear. Thanks for super heart, Eddie. Yeah, so today I'm very excited to share with you one of my favorite, uh, very special insect to me. It is the Eastern Tent Caterpillar. And these are ones that I collected from my grandmother's garden because I decided, I, when I saw them, I was like, there's no way my grandmother is gonna be okay with these caterpillars eating her plants. And, um, and so I, I decided to take some with me to raise them and um, enjoy them and enjoy the nostalgia that comes with them for me because it was these caterpillars and the scientific name is uh, Malacosoma Americana. I'll put it into the chat here on HAPS so you guys can see what that is. One second. Um, all right, putting this in the chat. I'll also put it as a notifier on HAPS um, so you guys can see even if you're off HAPS and watching from Twitch or Facebook or Twitter um, that here it is. It's going to go on the screen in one moment, the name of these caterpillars. Here it comes, I think. Or did it already go and I missed it? <laughs> I'll send it one more time. Push to program. All right. Where is it? There it is. It's very small, I suppose, but there it is, the name. <laughs> Um, translated American dreamer. Is it? Is that Ma Malakasoma? Does that mean dreamer? Um, Craig, how are you doing? Yeah. So one thing that's unfortunately missing in me showing you guys these caterpillars is that they don't have a tent because of the way that I've been rearing them in a container and just feeding them, feeding them food leaf by leaf. Uh, they don't really, we don't get to see the formation of the tent. I also had some videos, but I think I still need to learn about how HAPS manages videos that you upload because they just were not, they were showing up black in the, in the studio. So maybe it doesn't accept QuickTime or whatever default format uh, my iPhone makes when it makes a video. So I'll have to look into that. But wow, there's caterpillar poop all over my hand. Yay, but I'm happy about it. <laughs> um, oh, thanks for sharing that across platforms, David the name of these caterpillars. Oh yeah, so the breakdown of the scientific name there, Malacosoma is the genus. So if you think of the tree of life, kings play chess on fuzzy green stools, as an acronym I like to remember. Um, kingdom, phylum, arthropoda is the phylum for insects, class, insecta. Um, and then uh, from there it goes to order, which is Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, and then genus, which is Malacosoma, and then species, the species epithet is Americana, and then Americana, and Fabricius is the person who discovered the species, so he gets the name that comes after that, that species name, and then 1793 is the year that these were published and described as a new species. So they were discovered, the species was discovered uh, many years ago. I mean, it was, it was definitely noted and observed before that, um, for example, Penn State Extension page mentions that they were observed as early, let me just adjust this a little bit. Their tents were observed as early as, and noted as early as uh, 1646, according to Penn State University. Um, so they've been around, they just weren't officially documented in the scientific literature until that year. Um, 
So it's very important to publish. If you're sitting on something, make sure you publish it so you can get credit for it because that makes a difference of whether um, you get credited with discovering a species or somebody else does. Or same with ideas, you know, getting patents and things like that. So here are our little friends. I will use a macro lens in a moment so we can take a closer look at them. Um, but yeah, lots of critters all over my fingers. Let's count how many we have here today. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. There's a little one in here. I don't know why it's still so little. Little runt of the group. Much smaller than the rest. Oh, this one just fell off. And I did get them some fresh food when I went right before the broadcast. Uh, this is a piece of apple tree. So, so this is this insect is unique. Um, I'll say two prominent things about this insect before I dive into the details and before we get too deep into the broadcast um, for people who start to watch and then hi Blinky um, and then oh yeah a little hug for the caterpillars I'll, I'll give it a little hug for you <laughs> uh, pass it along oh wow this one just pooped some fresh frass as well fresh bug poop okay um, <laughs> it's falling down it's raining here uh, so these little guys are really special to me. Uh, they're, they're very notable because they will form these huge tents and really defoliate some trees. And that scares people. It makes people think that they're a bad bug and uh, want to take action to eliminate the caterpillars. And so they are very noticeable, pretty well known in the area um, in the eastern USA across, if you, if you cut the U.S. in half, maybe a little bit more to the west, they're all on the east side. Um, and they are oftentimes confused with gypsy moths, which are not native, but these are native. So even if you see them and it looks like they're messing up a tree, one thing I really want people to come away with in this broadcast is that they are, they are native here and so they're part of the ecosystem the trees that are here they know how to handle these caterpillars they're in a balance and and um <clears throat> one thing that is notable that i didn't really realize until but i kind of maybe had an inkling about um before i read about it today um when i was doing a little bit of background research on these guys is that and here i'll flip the camera so you can take a closer look in a moment. <laughs> I took out a piece of paper to uh, uh, what's it called? To have a white surface for them to be on and it's all stained with their brass now, but oh well. They're all little babies. The babies are eating well. That's a good sign. We like lots of brass. It means they're eating their meals and um, looks like very healthy brass, so that's a good thing. Um, so I'll put them down here so we can take a closer look. Okay. And so the re other reason that they're really special is, for those of you who know, and for those of you who don't know, um, I, this past year, was selected as a Fulbright National Geographic Storytelling Fellowship. One piece of news is that that's been postponed again, unfortunately, because of COVID. So won't be going, won't be started until January 2022, which is a bit of a bummer, but I'll figure out what, what I'll do, <laughs> uh, make do with you know, what I'm, what I'm presented with. Uh, but, but anyway, I bring that up to say that when I applied to the Fulbright opportunity, a National Geographic opportunity, I wrote about this specific caterpillar in my application. So um, I have my experiences, my memorable, um, impressionable experiences from these caterpillars when I was a kid that I wrote about to thank in part for the opportunity, so a little extra special. Okay, so, oh yeah, and David Howden is uh, translating, for those of you who may have missed earlier, that brass equals caterpillar poop. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a bummer, but um, it will come around soon enough. So I'm gonna flip the camera so you guys can see them closer. They're really beautiful fuzzy caterpillars. They have a black face. They have this very distinctive white line that go down the back of their body. Uh, and they have even blue, which is not a common scene, not a color seen too often um, in the natural world. So that's pretty unique. And um, they have these, they're just so fuzzy and cute. And so 
I grew up in the Philadelphia area with these in my backyard. Oh, and um, Penn State report, their extension page says that there are like surges in numbers of these every eight to 10 years. And that makes sense to me because I definitely remember um, back in the 90s uh, when my sister and I ran around the backyard looking at insects and finding these caterpillars, I just remember finding so many. So it must have been one of those special years when there was a huge surge in numbers. <clears throat> and I remember running around the backyard with Ileana, my sister, just collecting as many of these caterpillars as we possibly could and putting them into jars and watching them move around and nibble leaves and, and feeling the fuzziness of them and uh, just lots of fond memories of that. And that's pretty much what I wrote about in uh, my, my personal statement uh, for my uh, Fulbright National Geographic Storytelling Fellowship on my about my connection with insects and fond memories. And um, yeah, and one thing that really, that I, I grew up thinking these were bad bugs, as I mentioned before, I thought that they are bad, that they were that there are so many, it was overwhelming the trees. And so I grew up like in a neighborhood where my neighbors and even my family would um, would burn the nests, would burn the, the nests of the tent caterpillars. So what they do is when they walk around the tree, they leave a trail of silk with their mouths. I don't, I can't show you it right now, unfortunately, because these aren't, I'm not by the nest, but um. But Renee, I can tell you, do not squish these ones. If you see these ones, these are native. And so they are food for other organisms. They're food for birds. They're food for amphibians. They're food for other insects. These are a natural part of our ecosystem here. And so they are in balance, even when their populations spike. And they're, they're documented. Um, they're, they, don't cause, they don't cause trees to die, even though they alarmingly will defoliate some trees or parts of trees. Uh, once again, they are just part of the system here and the trees have been dealing with it for years and years and years. So um, it's not, there's, they're in balance, even if they may seem overwhelming. And part of the, of one thing that um, can help you realize how overwhelming it might be is that one, one clutch or one, um, Egg mass can have anywhere from like 50 to 350 or 400 eggs in it. So you'll get a lot of these caterpillars, but that's also part of the strategy strategy for their survival. Because as I said, as they move around, they produce silk and I'm putting my macro lens on. As they move around, they produce silk that comes from their mouth. They're kind of sleeping right now. They're not super active for whatever reason. I think that they're more active in the evening, but they produce this silk that, that creates the nest that grows and grows as they grow. And that's a, a place where they can be protected from being eaten, from being parasitized, uh, from the weather, from bad weather like rain. And um, I'll, I'll share a picture of it on my Instagram after this. I was hoping to share one, a video of, you guys, of it with you guys here, but unfortunately, um, I was having trouble uploading the video to the studio. Here, this one's reaching out. You can see its um, little its legs, front legs. You can see its tiny little antennae. Caterpillar have very short antenna because they don't need to reach out far because their food's right in front of their face. Um, so we have some comments here. How long until they transform? They take about six to eight weeks to feed as caterpillars before they pupate. Um, and uh-oh, Renee says I hit one on a lawnmower. Did it? Lots of caterpillar guts, maybe. Hi, Cycle Man. Um, do the adults have some of the same colors? The adults are brown and pretty drab looking. They are brown and they have a white band, like a white kind of two white wavy bands that go across the front legs. Yeah, I'll pet the caterpillar. Hi, caterpillar. Oh, here it is. Here's my finger for size comparison. Um, and the males tend to be a little darker and browner, and the females tend to be a little lighter in coloration and a little more yellow. Um, I do plan on rearing these ones to adulthood, so 
we can check back in. I can check back in with you about them to show you them in July when they emerge from their cocoon. So here's this one moving. Yeah, so do, do you think they have eyes? They do have eyes. The tricky thing about their eyes is that they blend in really well with their head because the eyes are black on their head. We can see if we can find some eyes, but they're, gonna, they're very small and they are, they blend in, yeah. Called stomata. Caterpillar eyes are called stomata. Uh, David says, a UK species in a genus I saw had an interesting behavior where they seem to wave their heads around at things near the web, perhaps to frighten things away. Yeah, I, it does seem that gregarious caterpillars, ones that live and eat together, sometimes will have synchronous movements, probably, which they do to seem like in an object that's larger than what they are so that they can scare things away. Strength in numbers. High five. Hi, Psycho Man, thanks. And thanks, Eddie, for the super heart. Um, oh, Blue Velvet said, I always see cocoons made of pine needles in my pines. What may those be? Those are the, those are bagworm moths. Uh, Psychodidae, I believe, or psychidae. Uh, sometimes I mix up my, the names. Um, psychidae, psychidae is the bagworm moth group. Clearing moths is another word for the, for the adults. Yeah, so these caterpillars are not munching right now. I think that it's because they're often active in the evening, though. Um, they'll eat cherry, apple, and actually that's probably why my family had so many back in the day when I was growing up, because we had huge wild cherry trees in the back of the yard, a really tall wild cherry tree. Um, so once again, this is the eastern tent caterpillar, a native native caterpillar. Um, it's definitely funny seeing them up close like this because you just see all the details of the, of the pattern on their bodies um, in a different way than from when you see them a little farther apart. So here they are a little farther apart, just really not moving too much. It's like the after, that's like they're, the babies are taking an afternoon nap. Renee says they look a lot like the caterpillars that were on my cabbage and broccoli plants. Oh, um, send me a picture sometime. One thing that you're, you're definitely going to get on broccoli is the, uh, what is it? The cabbage white butterfly, which is a non-native species of butterfly that is like a magnet to plants in that group. So broccoli plants and kale. Yeah. Eastern tent caterpillar. Yep. Just like that, David. <laughs> Um, all right. Um, where am I? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Renee said earlier, years back, they were way worse than they had been the past few years. Yeah, are you, think, are you thinking of the 90s also? Because that's when I remember there being tons of them when I was a kid, and it was very fun. Very, very fun. All right, so some other information about them. Um, they, yeah, they'll shelter in the web when not eating, which I don't have a picture of for you right now, so sorry. And um, and they overwinter as eggs. So the adults in July and June will make their, um, will make the, will leave egg masses behind. The females will leave egg masses on twigs and they're shiny and bright and I could see someone maybe mistaking them for a spotted lanternfly egg mass, but they're usually where spotted lanternfly egg masses are like on a flat surface. The here I'm gonna flip the camera so I can say hi to you again with them. Um, where spotted lanternfly egg masses are like flat and matte in coloration, these ones are very shiny and wrapped all the way around a smaller twig on the host plant. So sorry. Beautiful caterpillars. Okay, so these caterpillars are also the reason why I grew up believing that caterpillars are soft and fuzzy and harmless. And that is amusing to me now because when, because these are completely soft and fuzzy and harmless, they, their hairs are not irritating or anything like that. 
when I went to Borneo back in 2014 and 15, it was really funny to encounter the reactions of the local field assistants at the field site because they were terrified of fuzzy caterpillars. And I was like, what? Like fuzzy caterpillars are the best. They're soft and they're just hungry little caterpillars growing into adults. And then I learned about how there's a lot of fuzzy caterpillars in, in the world that have urticating hairs, hairs that irritate and get stuck into your skin. Um, especially over in Borneo, there were some caterpillars that like one of the, assist the local assistants there just had bumps all over his shoulder from one of the fuzzy caterpillars in the forest. And there was even one day when there was a caterpillar on the um, on the floor in the field station in Chuan and Borneo where um, the, there was this big caterpillar that just like when it reared its head up like everybody who was watching and who saw it there like screamed and I was like whoa <laughs> you'd think it was a snake or something like that but um, there's a reason for it some of them can really inflict a lot of pain but these ones are okay these eastern head caterpillars are harmless they're natives they're welcome and if a tree does end up passing away because they're defoliating it, it's probably because the tree was already dying for some other reason. So it's not, it's not an insect of concern. It's not a pet species, even though it might seem that way. Um, yeah, Blinky says, yeah, I thought I was taught furry ones were dangerous. Yeah, isn't that funny how different experiences, I, I totally was like, ants are nice, caterpillars are nice, and then like, later on they're all nice they're all just doing their thing but some ants of course bite and sting because they're more territorial and aggressive and then also some caterpillars are defended but not these ones <laughs> so um david's saying snake mimicry in caterpillars is a thing of course yeah that's true yeah yeah the one the one at the camp was just a big fuzzy caterpillar maybe even the same family as this one uh which i think is lazia campity but um, yeah, it wasn't. It was definitely not a snake mimic, the one that they were fearing. But there are snake mimics out there, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool world out there. Um, so yeah, this. I also did see. I, I do have a picture of tent caterpillars all together that I photographed in Yellowstone National Park, um, and I did post that on iNaturalist, and that was one that was. First, someone identified it as the Western tent caterpillar, then it was flipped back and identified as the Eastern tent caterpillar. So maybe there's some really close species, but you love all insects. That is true, <laughs> um, except for the one that stung me in Borneo. But yeah, I definitely remember like back in the day, like my sister and I would just run around and grab them and like put them on our face and um, just play with them. So this is my child. These are my childhood friends. <laughs> Um, this species, uh, and they just have such cute little heads too, because they're black and fuzzy and like velvet. Um, I can maybe I can give myself space bug new eyebrows. Anybody looking for some fuzzy caterpillar eyebrows? I don't think it's gonna stay. Not quite. Anyway, they have pretty good grip, <laughs> but um. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if they're edible for people. That's my next question, I suppose. I have no idea. I'm not going to try it. Um, but that's my next question. I wonder if there's someone who can answer that. If they eat apple plants and cherry trees and cherries and things like that, I'm guessing that they are probably okay to be edible, but I don't know. So try at your own risk. Um, <laughs> Looks scary having it on the face. Yeah, yeah, and this I guess is how comfortable I am with them. Um, and it does feel a little bit like it might fall off, but I guess that is, this one's, well, that one's attached pretty well. So, <laughs> yay. Um, oh, uh, on another note, and speaking of, I'm not gonna eat it live. <laughs> no, even though David's suggesting that idea. <laughs> but if you wanna, if you, no, I guess, I'll mail one to you and you can eat it live with me. How about that? Um, uh, I also want to say that I did just publish a little blog post, not little, a blog post 
on the Academy of Natural Sciences where I work on that on the blog page, the Academy's blog page about eating cicadas. So if you're interested in that, especially if you are on the East Coast and Midwest and about to experience the emergence that's impending of the 17 year cicadas, check it out. I will be sharing it on my Twitter page and also I'll post it here on HAPS too. Um, but I included a recipe of not shrimp and grits, but cicada and grits that I'm going to um, I'm going to try it out with the cicadas once they emerge here in Ann Arbor. So very exciting time. And I'll definitely be doing a broadcast on the magic cicadas soon. So definitely stay tuned for that. Yeah. But yeah, this is what I have for you guys today. Straightforward. Wanted to share with you my little caterpillar friends. Um, Unfortunately, they're not eating right now. I think that they only eat at dusk or like in the morning. Put this one on my cheek. Give myself uh, intense, uh, I don't know if there's a name for them. Is there a name for, oh, oh no. Is there a name for those, like the marks that people put on their face like this when they get intense for a competition or like field day or um, intense game? Is there a name for that? All right, I'm just gonna try the cheek thing. Maybe my, oh, it's staying. Here we go. Let's try this one. Oh, it's gonna go into my eye. Yay. <laughs> Living body oh, art. Okay, one fell off, but I caught it. More paint, more paint, more caterpillars. Er, I don't know what we're going to war for, but, <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway, so yeah, this is what I did as a kid, I guess, <laughs> and what I like to do today too. I don't know. Um, have fun with bugs and uh, especially the Eastern Tent Caterpillar, which in conclusion, oh, yikes. <laughs> Mark, hi, Mark. Mark says, at first I thought they were leeches. Not leeches. Um, have you guys ever had leeches before on you? I had one leech once between, one huge one from the Adirondacks in, in um, New York, which Went, was right between my toes. And it was, oh, it hadn't bitten yet, but, oh, there, Frank, Frank shared my blog that I, that I wrote. It's called How to Celebrate the 17 Year Cicadas, and one way to do that is to eat one, so you can read more about that there, um, and to answer your question, Blue Velvet, um, are you on the hunt for any special insects in Michigan, Ohio area? area? The natural cicada, the 17 year cicadas are the insects that I have an eye out for now. I did find one yesterday. I shared that experience um, a little bit on my Instagram. Um, I probably will do a live stream on them sometime soon. I wasn't prepared to do one at that time um, that I found that first one, but uh, uh oh. Okay. I have a very long eyebrow, you guys. <laughs> that goes down my nose. <laughs> um, Oh, that's right. Eye black. Oh, David. Yeah. Thanks, David. It's eye black. It helps to dim the light reflecting into the eyes. Cool. Yeah. So you can see better. Um, your leeches are freaking out. Yeah. Actually, one of my coworkers at the Academy of Natural Sciences, I don't know if she still does, but for a while she had pet, a pet leech, a couple of pet leeches. Um, Renee says, yeah, I'd be pretty hungry to eat a cicada. <laughs> Um, would you eat it drizzled in on chocolate? Maybe this is an opportunity to write another version, an insect version of green eggs and ham. Would you eat it with some chocolate? Would you eat it with some barbecue sauce? Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. No. <laughs> Do the caterpillars drink water? That's a great question, Eddie. Um, they, they get a lot of their water from the plants and because I'm giving them plants that I'm snapping from the tree and they're not eating directly from the tree, I am a little bit wary about them not getting enough water because that means that the leaves that they're eating might be a little more desiccated than it might be out in the wild. So when I do give them these leaves, I do spray the leaves a little bit to help keep the moisture up. And 
um, to, to make sure, to help like ensure that they're getting enough water. So you need it with hot sauce, Blinky? Is that what you're saying? Thanks for the super heart, Eddie. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, a lot of insects will get it from their food, but um, sometimes they will eat from, um, oh, I'm gonna show you guys some things before we do wrap up. Okay, uh, here you can see, I'm oh, sorry, these leaves are getting in the way. Just wanted to show you guys it up close. You can see those three legs right there. Those are the true legs of the caterpillar. So caterpillars are known to have a lot of legs. They really just have six true legs like any other insect. And then the rest of the legs down here, these ones are called pseudo legs or pro legs. They're called pro legs. They're not real legs, um, but they've kind of, they basically work like legs though. It's a bit different of course, because it takes a lot of um, like the pressure inside of the caterpillar's body for that part to function. but um, they definitely help the caterpillar with grip and holding on to leaves and other surfaces and my nose, for example. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, David is adding some info. Let me just plug my phone in because it got a little dark for some reason. Maybe it'll help power it up. Okay. Uh, David is saying that in the Lazio Campani, there is a species with the vernacular name, the drinker, because it's observed drinking water. Cool, yeah. So I wonder, you know, I wonder if these ones do explicitly drink water. We can try. I have a water, my spray bottle right over here. Of course, I don't know if these will be thirsty, but we can try. reaching out to see what's around. Hey, come drink some water. What? Caterpillar wrangler. No, nope, not interested in water right now. Where is it? It's probably trying to find its way back home. Since they do like to live with each other. Here, I'll put this up. Here you go, caterpillar. Back on to your host plant. My apple tree. <laughs> uh, although I don't feel too bad giving it ap my apple tree from outside, even though I want apples, because I didn't prune the apple tree this year, and orchard plants really need to be pruned year to year. That's how they're properly managed. Um, Blue Velvet says, I always cast the milkweed out here to feed monarch caterpillars need to plant special flowers for adults this year. Oh, nice, cool, good luck, yeah. It can be very fun to um, plant for wildlife and really nice and rewarding, often rewarding challenge. Um, <gasps> Blinky Bill says, I've had witchetty grubs. No sauce. How was it? Witchetty grubs are a grub that eats the witchetty plant in Australia that um, has been eaten by people in Australia for, dare I say, hundreds and hundreds of years. They take a stick and they dig around the roots of the witchetty plant to find the grubs at the base that are eating the plant. Um, David says, well, they simply absorb the water into their skin. So I don't think that, I don't think that happens with them, but maybe it happens to the same extent that it happens with us. Like if we're in a humid area, I think what can, I wonder if just by, well, so I know that when insects breathe and they open their spiracles or breathing holes, that does put them at risk of losing water if they're in a dry condition, a dry environment. So I'm guessing that having a more humid environment probably does help them to some extent with um, retaining moisture. I don't know if it helps them with picking up more moisture, just being around the water and not having it go into their mouth, but it at least helps prevent them from losing moisture. 
do the caterpillars help do these caterpillars help in pollination i don't know a lot about these caterpillars when it comes to their adult stage there wasn't when i was digging around a bit to get some um, extra background info for this broadcast i didn't come across much about what the adults eat and i think that's in part because because they eat plants that we humans find desirable since they eat orchard plants that kind of makes them somewhat problematic or fall into the potential pest category, even though they're native. And so because of that, I think that so much of the focus goes into caterpillar, their caterpillar stage rather than what they're doing um, or what they're eating as adults. So I'm not sure um, what they eat as adults, but good question. I'm very curious too. They could be generalists or they could um, have certain flowers they visit as adults. I believe they have mouth parts, but I'm not totally sure either. I, they probably do because that's like the default, but there are some, some groups out there that don't have mouth, like silk moth, which I'm making a blog post on uh, for the museum, um, and that'll, that'll come out in the next couple of weeks too. So stay posted. How big are the tents that they're making? Oh, they get pretty big. So what's, one thing that's fun about the tents is that, and thanks guys for the super hearts and the high, the highs and the appreciate. Rub hub. Yep, that's that's a I'm gonna have to save that, Chris, as a future broadcast title when I find a tent to show you guys. <laughs> um, the tents, they. Oh, oh wait, I think I did upload a picture. So I have this picture of. Yay, being connected on my computer too. Okay, I have this picture of the, this is a bunch of them that were in Yellowstone. And so you can see how they just, you know, sibling, big sibling party in the tent. And they just all right up, up with each other, probably helps with a defense, making them look bigger than they actually are. Also maybe helps with predator, predator satiation. Um, you can't actually see the tent too well in this photograph, though. Uh, I will let you guys Google what the what the tent what the tents look like because I don't have that on hand to show you. But this is a photo I took from Yellowstone National Park in the USA a couple years ago. Um, but as they get, as when they first start off when they're first born, their tent is little like they are, and then um, as I said earlier. Their tent grows as they grow, and as they move, they leave trails of silk behind. So it just builds up from them walking all over the place, which also gets me to think thinking about like how they must some they must like have some internal instruction on how to walk about and how to move. I mean, of course they do because you need you have internal instincts and and ways that you go about like eating food and responding to threats. And um, think, and interacting with other species and and that sort of thing, but it also makes me wonder about um, like how they walk around to build up that nest. Like, do they walk around extra when they get back to the nest because that helps build up the nest, or what? If you know what I mean. So, hi Peter, how are you? Um, and the tents are made by the community of caterpillars. Yes. So uh, once again, the caterpillar, the egg masses have anywhere from like 50 to 350 eggs. Uh, and, um, and so there are just hundreds of caterpillars that are like walking around, going, getting some food, walking back to the tent to hang out. And so as they move around, just more and more silk is accumulating. And so it makes these big tents that help protect them from being eaten from being from parasites it didn't protect them from me adopting some so hopefully they're happy though Take, i'm feeding them fresh food every day <laughs> um yeah darko hi darko uh yep yeah, hanging out uh remembering the good old days when i was running around the backyard with my sister collecting them and putting them in jars and putting them on our faces and enjoying them <laughs> um why thank you it's the latest style here in Ann Arbor. Um, hello, Betty. How are you over in Tallahassee? Yeah. So, uh, what was I saying? 
so yeah the tent just builds up and so as I get bigger the tent gets bigger and also like the the approximately three foot radius around the tent gets ex extra defoliated on the tree. Um, high five, Peter, thanks. Um, Darko's asked me if I'm in cicada country. I'm looking forward to hearing about them. Yeah, I am. And I found my first one yesterday uh, and I'm keeping an eye out and planning on cooking them or finding some that I can collect and cook. I'm a little concerned about sourcing them because I, I don't, I don't have permission. I want to do it the right way. I don't have permission from like to collect them in the forests here. Also, yeah, the forests or the forests. I call them forests. I think it's my Philly accent, so I'm not totally sure where that comes from. <laughs> uh, but from the forests or forests here. And uh, so I'm probably going to see if I can find someone who lives on a property where there's a lot of periodical cicadas um, where I can get um, permission to collect like 50 of them to cook. Yeah, I'm also working with the local videographer to put together a video on it. And so hoping that Rev or someone here on Haps is gonna have another film festival that we can submit our video to. So, <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna post the link that actually Frank shared earlier about the blog that I just wrote about the periodical cicadas so you guys can check it out. It's how to celebrate the 17 year cicadas. Eat one. I'll put it here in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Doctor says I didn't know about that cuisine. When I was nine we lived in DC where they were everywhere. Shake a tree and they would fall out. Wow. Yeah, DC is totally a hot spot for where this is happening. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to eat one of these guys, but I'll eat one of the cicadas on HAPS when um, they come out. But it's they're coming out in Maryland now, but since I'm way more north and at the northern part of the range up here in Michigan, they are going to come out probably last, which is too bad. But uh, I'm waiting patiently and um, just it's fun to watch the whole thing. Raw or stewed? In the past, I had one raw and it tasted surprisingly good. The one that I ate raw had a bad molt, so it wasn't going anywhere anyway. Oh, I just pooped off my face. <laughs> um, the things you say in entomology. <laughs> um, thanks, David, for coming by and also for sharing the species name of the eastern tent caterpillar, which is the focus with the, the clear and easy distraction of periodical cicadas, because that's what's hot right now, periodical cicadas. Um, so Frank is asking, how long will the cicada season last this year? Hi, David. Um, it will last, well, okay. So we have different species of cicadas. There are three periodical cicadas emerging, emerging three species that all comprise and make up brood 10. Brood 10, I should hold this up since this is the topic of, I want to hold it up because it's the topic of our broadcast anyway, in case we come back to it. <laughs> um, Yes, yummy, Betty. Have, you haven't had some before, have you? Have you had them? Um, so we get annual cicadas each year, but then we also get these periodical cicadas um, more infrequently because they emerge on prime numbers. Like 17 is the biggest number that, that we're aware of that they emerge. I feel like if there was a bigger number, it would have been identified by now since period, periodical cicadas were recognized like 150 years ago and more. Um, oh yeah, great pictures at the link you posted. Yeah, um, yeah, they're there. I plan on taking a bunch myself when the emergence happens, but I haven't had the opportunity to take pictures of them in the past. Um, I'll take this one off my nose now. <laughs> I need to put it back with its friends. Here you go. There we go. Back on your host plant, an apple tree. Yummy, yummy apple tree. Maybe I can get some earrings and wear, wear cicada earrings next. Living, start a new fashion of, oh, it looks kind of fun. I like it. <laughs> it wouldn't be safe for the caterpillars, of course, this sort of fashion. But um, since I'm hurrah for tangents, I will mention that the, oh, I can hear them. 
I can hear them moving around. Can I hear what I'm eating or is it just moving? Kind of a funny sound to hear. <laughs> Someone eating? Is that what I hear? I think it's just scraping on the leaves. <laughs> Tickly. It's like, ah, I can, I can start a business. ASMR. ASMR earrings. Uh, live caterpillar ASMR earrings. <laughs> um, this one's not going to fit up here because I don't have, it doesn't have a hook like this, this stick does. Maybe they're talking to each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're human whispers, whispering to me. Um, <laughs> on a roll award. Thanks, Frank. Um, ah, what was I saying a moment ago? I don't know. But um, thanks for coming by, Eddie. Uh, thanks for your questions, guys, and have a great day. Cheers. Yeah, Brano Bouquet, totally. Yeah. Um, that's a great idea. Yeah. Too bad I got married in the fall. They weren't available then. They're not around in the fall. Yeah, can't cut a floor whisper. Yeah, so, oh, it looks like it's about to munch, maybe, but maybe not. Anyway, um, I am going to wrap up the broadcast now, though. So thanks, guys, for joining. And if you have any more questions lingering, feel free to put them in the uh, chat below. We have a tick researcher who will be joining us in um, in a couple of weeks on the 25th, um, I believe. And spiders and um, wait, sips and spiders with Sebastian and Salaj is happening. I believe it's happening next Tuesday. So check the schedule for the bug scope. It's in my profile uh, for the upcoming events. Otherwise. Take care, guys. Thanks for joining. Cheers. Thanks, Marion, for all the caterpillars. Got to give me 320 more to equal a clutch of these guys since they can have up to 350 in a egg mass. So I'll wait. Just kidding. Um, all right. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Joining um, and saying hello to my favorite, one of my favorite insects, the Eastern Tent Caterpillar. Um, I hope that you guys are able to come across them one day if you haven't already. And I hope that if you have met them before, you understand them a little better now and can appreciate them more for the wonderful native species that they are. So, bye everyone. Oh, I forgot that I still have that picture up. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so bye everyone from me and our caterpillar friends. Have a great day or evening or night or morning.